I'm Jason MacArthur, the events coordinator for the Public Programs Department of the California Institute of Integral Studies, a nonprofit university in San Francisco. Now, let me first introduce our presenters, Zara Zimbardo and Patrick Rainsborough, then we'll get right to the talk. Zara Zimbardo is a faculty member in the School of Undergraduate Studies and MFA program at CIIS, whose scholarship focuses on critical media literacy, subversion of stereotypes, social justice comedy, capitalist monsters, and the zombie apocalypse. She is a co-founder of Partners for Collaborative Change, which supports organizations to become more equitable through democratizing research planning and design and through anti-oppression facilitation. Patrick Grainsboro is a strategist, organizer, and creative provocateur with over 30 years of experience in diverse US social movements. He is the author of the widely used activist manual, Reimagining Change, how to use story-based strategy to win campaigns, build movements, and change the world. And now let me turn it over to Zara and Patrick. Hello. Hi. Hello. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you for that introduction, Jason. And we wanna thank all of the wonderful folks at Public Programs at CIS for this invitation and opportunity to co-present on apocalyptic narratives and realities. Um, when I was talking uh, some weeks ago with some of the people at Public Programs about this topic um, and this content and its relevance to the time that we're in right now, they asked who might I like to be in conversation with? And so the first person I thought of is my life partner, Patrick, um, because this is what we talk about all the time um, together at home. Um, and so this is a novel experience for both of us to be you know, co-presenting publicly as we're sheltering in place together, which is strangely intimate and delightful as we're all joined together and we are all simultaneously both in and not in each other's homes in this Zoom room, this placeless space. We want to acknowledge the physical place that we are in. Um, people who are joining us now or listening to a future podcast, maybe living in different geographical locations, Patrick and I are in Oakland, the original name of which is Huchun, which is the homelands of the Chochenyo Ohlone people who have cared for this land and who have been in deep kinship with it since time immemorial and continue to steward this land today and who provide visionary leadership um, in terms of intergenerational healing in just and habitable futures. Um, we are talking about apocalypse this evening. And so we also want to acknowledge that for indigenous peoples across California, across this country, across this continent and across the Americas, that indigenous peoples have lived through multiple apocalypses and post-apocalyptic realities of genocide, ecocide, and attempted ethnocide, which they continue to resist today in our present time and to hold a wide range of visions for what life can be like before, beyond, and through these omnicidal systems. We live in a time now, and I imagine that's why many people have joined this conversation, when apocalyptic narratives circulate very thickly that come from different sources, right? From media, from religion, from climate science, and 
So we want to start with tuning in to our own mental landscapes. If you're staring at a computer screen, it might be helpful to close your eyes and just to look at what are some of the most immediate um, images and scenarios that are available to us in our mental landscapes, dreamscapes, and mental libraries. So when you hear the term apocalypse or the phrase, the end of the world, what first comes to mind? What scenarios or images do you see? These might be of the Hollywood blockbuster variety. They might be images that come from organized religion. It might be something sudden, spectacular, cataclysmic. Is there a lot of fire around? Is there a lot of water around? What are people doing? In these visions. Or you might see the apocalypse as slow and steady decay or something else entirely. So as we notice what has the most immediacy and vividness, right? What is most accessible to us when we think about end times, end of days, end of worlds, the apocalypse, we can notice what happens in our nervous systems do we feel energy completely drain out of us and feel flooded with despair? Do we feel a surge of excitement or some kind of visceral thrill? What kind of spaces do these visions open up in terms of what is possible, what is thinkable? Do these spaces open up different ways of thinking and feeling? or do they close them down, right? And that might all be happening simultaneously. So noticing this, um, two questions that we want to pose and hold throughout this conversation is whose imaginations are we living within? Who created these images? who painted and illustrated these pictures, right? Where do they come from? And the second question is, what do these apocalyptic scenarios and narratives do, right? Do they fill us with some sense of hope and possibility, of strangeness to think different thoughts, feel different feelings? Um, or do they close that space? And that or might be an and, right? Of like a lot of paradoxical feelings, sensations and thoughts coming up at once. Well, thank you for that, um, Sarah. Thank you for grounding us and for reminding us how close the apocalypse and apocalyptic narratives are for all of us, um, closer for some than others, rooted in the histories that some have experienced, rooted in communities that are experiencing an ongoing apocalypse. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you again to everybody who's joining us. We know that at this point in the pandemic, the Zoom novelty may have worn off. So really appreciate you coming out for this conversation. And uh, we thought just to ground things, as Zara said, we're trying to give you the feeling that we're having you over to dinner at our house, chatting about the things that we chat about. As you'll soon learn from us, we don't see apocalypticness as, as an inherently negative thing. So I don't take that assumption that we're, that we're not approaching this with lots of joy and liberatory potential. Um, but in terms of grounding us and laying the foundations for this conversation, um, I wanted to ask you a question, Zara, you know, because you've been thinking and researching and writing about apocalyptic narratives um, for quite some time as one of your areas of scholarship. And I thought maybe we could start by just saying what, what got you interested in thinking about the apocalypse? Yeah, well, you know, I am, um, 
somewhat of a late bloomer in terms of my appreciation for science fiction, speculative fiction, dystopian and apocalyptic fiction. And actually when Patrick and I first started dating 16 years ago, um, he introduced me to the work of Octavia Butler um, and specifically to uh, read, invited me to read the parable of the sower and parable of the talents written in the 1990s, talking about an apocalyptic world in the 2020s, which is where we are now. And that was such an experience to read this work, which was unlike anything I had ever read, um, was so intense. And when I would pull myself out of um, Butler's writing would have this really, would be in like an altered state looking around. Um, right, feeling very alert in a different way, noticing things in a different way, feeling that my perception had changed. Um, and I think that's one of the most exciting things about different types of apocalyptic fiction is that it, compel, it can compel us to look at the world differently and connect these dots between present and near and far future scenarios. Um, I've been deeply inspired in recent years by the work of Adrienne Marie Brown and Walida Imarisha, who in homage to Octavia Butler, have been really popularizing the understanding that all social change and social justice organizing is science fiction. Right, that people who are working and dedicating their life energy to a different and better and more just and humane world that world doesn't exist yet. And that the first step towards it is to inhabit it in that space of imagination, um, to dream it so that we can then bring it to down to earth and into reality. And they talk about science fiction as a training ground. And so that's been a question that has really intrigued me is like, what are we practicing? What futures are we rehearsing as we enter into some of these different fictional landscapes? Um, some years ago, um, you know, I'm a critical media studies uh, scholar and geek, um, but I'm not someone who's ever been, I know I've always been repelled by horror and gore genres. So it was a surprise that I got so intrigued by looking at media around the zombie apocalypse, which was explosive in its popularity. Um, in the early 2000s and 2010s. And part of what compelled me was to look at how in all kinds of media, as well as in popular discourse, um, there was this bizarre normalization of the zombie apocalypse, right? Which is um, a dominant, has been a dominant mythology of our times, a dominant fantasy and as such is worth taking seriously. Um, and it is on one core level, a narrative of a virus of uncontainable viral infection that completely upends the world as we know it in which surviving humans are forced to make all, are forced to navigate. And some of the um, things that particularly interested me um, you know, and this is a global phenomenon, but particularly in terms of, you know, like the United Statesian <laughs> psyche was ways that the zombie apocalypse as one dominant narrative um, was a way of a, like a code for talking about the end of the world, right? A fake apocalypse to talk about economic, social and environmental horror that may be indigestible um, and to, as a way to bring fears and anxieties very close while also keeping them at bay, like a joking, not joking. Um, it's hyper real, yet it's also a fake mock apocalypse. And so I've been curious about that movement of bringing these realities or imaginations close and distancing. Um, a key question for me looking at zombie apocalypse and apocalyptic fiction more broadly um, has also been this question of like, of course, for many people, this can operate as an escape fantasy, 
right where we enter and then we come back home and it's like, whew, all right, I'll just have a glass of water and go back to that email I was writing. Things are not as bad. Um, but I'm more interested in the ways that apocalyptic fiction helps us turn towards apocalyptic realities, right? And to connect those dots. Um, what does it help us see? What does it help us perceive when we look at stories that are a few degrees more extreme um, than what we're witnessing right now? Um, and one last thing that I find incredibly compelling in terms of different research that I've done and uh, being a you know, avid media consumer <laughs> um, is this deep longing that exists for a radical transformation. And within the US, perhaps that longing is also coupled with despair of its potential for radical transformation. Um, and, you know, this like obsessive and repetitive um, different scenarios, zombie apocalypse or other apocalyptic and dystopian scenarios are a drastic way out of our current systems which often seem like there's no way out. Um, and so I've been curious about that kind of nightmarish um, longing. Um, yeah, so much more to say. Um, but Patrick, I want to ask you, um, you have been a involved in grassroots organizing around social and environmental issues for over 30 years and in a wide range of different campaigns. And you became deeply interested and invested in looking at narrative, the role of narrative, narrative power and narrative strategy um, for social change practitioners and movements. Um, you wrote a book called Reimagining Change, which goes into this in depth. Um, could you share a few pieces in terms of like what particularly compels you about the role of narrative and collective action. Yeah, well, I mean, as you said, um, narrative is, is really one of the key arenas of struggle for as we're trying to make change. You know, I, I come from a background of trying to um, fight alongside communities on the front lines to make a better world. And it's all about social change work is all about power, right? And how power operates and the collective power we have when we come together and unite to stand up to the coercive power of illegitimate institutions and of injustice. And doing that work, it became clear how much narrative was at play and was this arena. So much of the work of social change is about fundamentally changing the stories that we use to make meaning in the world. And a lot of my work has focused on what it means to be in a battle of the story um, between um, different um, visions of the world, different senses of possibility, different ways of demystifying how power actually operates. So in the same way that we're, we're good at analyzing power in a lot of um, material systems and saying, oh, here's, here's how money is flowing in the economy. Here's how politics works and which corporation is buying off which politician and that kind of a power analysis that we uh, in our social movements needed stronger tools to do a narrative power analysis mm -hmm. to understand um, which narratives were legitimizing injustice, which narratives were opening up space for possibility, um, that ultimately that was a key arena of struggle. And if we couldn't at this particular time, I think maybe the premise of this conversation and perhaps why so many of us are drawn to looking at apocalyptic narratives in this moment and in general, these are our mother load narrative interventions, imagining dramatic radical change in the system. And we all know that the current system that we're living in is a literal doomsday economy um, and taking us off the edge of an ecological cliff and dragging down human dignity and cultural diversity and all the life on this planet with it. Um, so we're in the, we're, we're in the, there's a deep need for, um, for interventions in the narrative. You know, and one of the ways I think about the uh, apocalyptic narratives is in this context of, of myth and mythology and mythology being, I think one of the biggest mistakes that um, 
progressives sometimes make about being overly factual. Um, obviously the facts are incredibly important, but we sometimes miss where the power of a story lives. It's got nothing to do with its factual accuracy. The power of a story lives in its ability to make meaning for us. And so myths and mythology are, you know, that's a kind of a sloppy um, way that we're like myth as lie. We mean, what we mean is a lie and say that's a myth, but really myth as meaning is I think a more powerful way to understand how our minds work, how collectively we work. And so when you're talking about narrative power, you can talk about some of these mythologies that are deeply ingrained that are actually co control mythologies, that their role as a story is to prop up the current status quo, is to maintain social control. I mean, think about so much of the mythologies that circulate in America today from you know, trickle down and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and the big government, you know, that is somehow oppressing us, you know, or jobs versus the environment. Somehow we can't have both, <laughs> even though as, uh, as there, our own Northern California famous martyred labor and environmental organizer, Judy Berry, Judy Berry used to say, there's no jobs on a dead planet. Like a lot of these mythologies make no sense um, but they, they operate as a form of power. And so my interest in narrative has always been about how collective action can express itself in not only changing our physical and economic systems, but in order to facilitate that kind of change, changing the narratives and the myths that we use to understand um, our world. Awesome, thank you. Um, so that's so, apocalypse and that's narrative. <laughs> Boom. Where do we go now? There you go. Um, so we, you know, the term apocalypse, uh, as it's commonly understood, and this is one of the ways that we're using this term is of the end of the world as we know it, right? The end of the world, as we know it, radical transformation, disrupt, destruction, disruption. Another meaning of apocalypse, which is less commonly known that we wanna really lift up and hold alongside, comes from the original term um, in Greek, apocalypsis, which means pulling aside the veil, right? Or lifting the veil, revelation or disclosure of knowledge. And so this is a key question in terms of ways that um, apocalyptic fiction, and then realities of disasters, crises, ruptures, um, function to pull aside the veil that can shroud and obscure and mystify business as usual and make different realities more apparent. Um, can make the invisible visible, right? What was previously unimaginable, imaginable, um, or unthinkable, thinkable. Um, and Boom. I just want to underscore what you just said in terms of making the invisible visible, how profound mm -hmm. that is as a social change strategy. Right, absolutely. And which is often a first step, right, to like know what we're addressing and engaging. Um, and that is a lot of work, right, to make that visible, to make that tangible. Um, and this is also what pandemics do, right? And uh, apocalyptic uh, fiction, you know, for example, <laughs> in terms of zombie apocalypse, um, part of this veil that gets removed time and time again, um, like what is the work of the virus is that it reveals to us the impermanence and fragility of all human institutions. It, everything we've ever built, all this solid ground is suddenly shifting and we can't rely on it. It also reveals the profound intimacy of our bodily vulnerability um, and of our interdependence and our interconnection. And so right now living in this historic pandemic era, we want to look at some of the veils that are being pulled aside that are specific to COVID, but also relate to different disasters and pandemics um, more generally. Um, 
Patrick, I wanna hand it over to you in terms of what is being made visible and apparent right now. Yeah, I think that's a, a very provocative question for all of us in terms of what's getting, how, where is the veil getting lifted? COVID is obviously such an ongoing um, tragedy and causing so much pain and suffering and also revealing incredible things about our society that many people knew already and experienced, but people that were a little more sheltered maybe didn't. It's pretty hard to miss the way that COVID is laying bare the, the brutal inequities of our society. Um, around race, around class, around age, ability, health, all of these different issues, particularly around racism. Um, you know, it's easy to say, to have this very scientific kind of molecular level of vision on of like, oh, viruses don't discriminate. We're all vulnerable. Of course we are. There's a universal experience there, but like almost all universal experiences in our current society and system, just because we're all impacted does not mean we're all impacted equally. And in fact, the virus may not discriminate, but um, our society discriminates. <laughs> so COVID reveals these vectors of vulnerability. We know already here in the United States, it's disproportionately killing black folks, disproportionately impacting people of color. Um, what vulnerability it shows when we say, great, let's all shelter in place. So many of us in this country don't have places to safely shelter. The unhoused community, folks that don't have a living situation that's safe from violence of different sorts of intimidation and domestic violence. Um, so a lot of that's getting laid bare. I think one of the things that's been fascinating in the broader discourse around COVID is this notion of an essential worker um, and how we, how we relate to that and how both people are politically activating around it and showing their solidarity. Um, you know, you it reveals things that um, that are hard to miss. Where it's like, you know, stockbrokers, intellectual property lawyers, maybe not so essential when you're talking about food, healthcare, um, nurses, doctors, healthcare professionals. They're putting their lives on the line for um, saving one of the folks who are staffing um, our food system and. Um, working in our grocery stores. And this irony that's revealed that we can say someone's essential, that it's essential that the grocery stores stay open, yet our society is so inequitable that we can't even provide a living wage or healthcare to these supposedly essential um, workers. And so I just think that's a very, um, it's very revealing in that way. Um, going back to the theme of sort of making what was invisibilized visible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also, I mean, when we're talking about vectors, right, and vectors of vulnerability, um, something that is so, you know, peculiar and fascinating, and I wonder what the lasting ripple impacts will be of this time, is that as we move through the outside world and being aware of our bodies, interactions with others, touching different surfaces, we are seeing and sensing this invisible microbial realm. <laughs> right, like six feet of distance, getting a sense of how our particles, <laughs> right, and how our germs may um, interact in terms of these vectors of transmission, which can, of course, breed um, paranoia, can breed really smart safety, um, as well as a deep sense of our, like a somatic sense of our connection um, and vulnerability. Um, and care and protection for each other, right? That we are bound within with, with each other um, and the virus that we are all in a relationship with now helps show us that. Um, in terms of, right, apocalyptic pulling aside the veil, at this time, um, very acutely, right? And at other times of um, crisis, disaster, part of what we're also seeing are the systems and the infrastructure that support our lives, right? And things that might've been abstract or um, not really understanding or appreciating so well um, become glaringly apparent um, and become much more vivid and much more real. Um, how our food system works, right? Food is something that unites us all. Um, and uh, people, for example, like um, David Masumoto from the Masumoto Family Farm in the Central Valley, 
um, has been bringing together different perspectives, um, really highlighting that this crisis is compelling us to understand our food systems differently, to see what a touch heavy industry it is, to see the whole supply chain, to really look deeply to see who grows and harvests and prepares and delivers um, our food. Um, right, and so, you know, as well as looking at our medical system, right? Who is being served? Who is being left out? Whose lives are being valued and devalued? Um, and so apocalyptic nonfiction realities, um, as well as apocalyptic fiction um, can help us to see these systems in a different way, right, of this, as Teknat Han talked about, this Buddhist practice of looking deeply, seeing all of the human labor, all of the natural resources, all of the ecosystems that go into a single object or a commodity or food um, that support our lives. Um, in terms of, right, this notion of pulling aside the veil. We can also ask, well, what is the veil <laughs> that is being lifted or being dissolved in times like this? Um, right, and the veil itself can be all of, as Patrick was talking about earlier, control mythologies and different national bedtime stories that justify an inequitable and unjust status quo, right? And that can obscure and mystify and shroud the violence, the structural violence that upholds business as usual. And that tells us this is just the way things are. And um, this is how they've always been. And there's really no other alternative. And so in times like these, there's actually a tremendous opening of alternatives and some of those um, status quo shrouding mystifying mythologies are revealed in their in their falseness um, I think as we wake up to our interconnection and yeah. i think it's worth just adding in there as we sort of practice a narrative power analysis practice seeing and naming stories and seeing how they operate you're talking about there is no alternative that is such a neoliberal story. I mean, literally mm -hmm. the acronym TINA um, created by Margaret Thatcher at the rise of neoliberalism. There is no alternative. And it's an example of a really crappy story. I mean, it's pretty easy to disprove that story. You're saying, really, there's no alternative? Seems like there's probably some alternatives, but it just shows how narrative power operates to try to mystify that. And I think we see that over and over again, the Tina narrative is one of the most um, common kind of control mythologies that's used by power holders. Absolutely, right, which can get upended in times like these. Mm -hmm. um, so related to this, Patrick, you, um, in your work, in your book, you have talked about and written about um, psychic breaks um, and the and the power in terms of activists being able to harness psychic breaks. Could you share a little bit about like what that means? Yeah, and how that might apply today. Absolutely, and just the notion of a psychic break being a time when a dominantly held narrative breaks down publicly and opens up possibilities. So think of these big moments that happen in our society. Think of a 9-11 a or the election of an overt racist fascist like Donald Trump. Um, people have these moments where they realize um, that sometimes stories they thought were true about the world are not true. COVID is an incredible example of this. All sorts of things, a shift from the status quo that opens up possibilities. Um, I think is really important um, in bringing a narrative power analysis to understand what the disruptions and interventions in a narrative are. Because, and that's what we mean by narrating change, is that at a time like COVID, narrative is the realm where we're making collective meaning. Um, the collective meaning that we make of these incidents is what then drives policy, what legitimizes um, 
all of the different changes that happen in our society from whether we're going to declare a war or whether we're going to start providing universal health care. So narrating a change like COVID, uh, I think, is, is super high stakes. We're really narrating the apocalypse is what we're doing because that's what so many folks are are living through. And I think this is one of the potentials of COVID. We're seeing it bubbling up where people are like, we can't just go back to normal. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, normal sucked. Normal was um, a, you know, a pathway to destruction. Normal was a society that was perpetuating longstanding patterns of white supremacy, racism, exploitation, the erosion of human dignity. Um, we can't go back to that here now that we've already shown that we can change in response to the a collective threat like COVID, there's a huge opportunity um, to move forward. And so that's the potential, I think, around a psychic break and narrating change. And we see it in the, in the battle of the story that's happening around COVID um, is, is a very clear one that many of us are experiencing. I mean, just look at the different we can, it's a place where we can start to talk about the real issues in our society, the, the deeper stories, like what is the role, what is the role of government? What is the purpose of our economy? I mean, literally that's the battle of story around COVID where you have, um, I mean, it's like shockingly transparent Republican narrative of like economy almost as angry God that demands sacrifice. Like go out and sure, one to 2% of the population is gonna to need to die, but that's how we gotta get the economy back on track. Um, you have armed like white people storming capitals <laughs> across the United States who are sort of claiming that, that collective action by big government is somehow a threat to their individual liberty. And this framing as like, what is, you know, what is government? What is the economy? And I think that tension, you know, is, is the role of the government in the economy? Um, there's an alternative narrative there. We're saying it's really about our collective well-being, right? We don't work for the economy. The economy is supposed to work for us. If you're contrasting the economy, this mythic idea of the economy with public health and well-being, then you're creating a fantasy. The economy is supposed to be a tool of public health. The economy is supposed to be what uh, provides for us. Health should be a basic human right. So I think there's a incredible battle, the story happening around all this stuff. And it's just a way that apocalyptic moments open us up for the deeper questions or, or even some of what you were saying, Zara, about um, society and human nature. That's always mm -hmm. what's at play in an apocalyptic narrative, right? And it's at play with COVID right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right, this is something that we've seen uh, you know, or born witness to, right? And we, I'm saying, right, all of us present in this conversation um, time and time again in terms of like mainstream media around natural disasters, et cetera, is like which narratives rise to the surface and are more dominant about what it means to be like, what is human nature? Are we inherently selfish, right? And some of these fear-based narratives, right? That disaster brings up people's worst. Right, and then there's other people, communities, groups, efforts to really amplify the narratives in terms of looking at ways that um, unprecedented cooperation and a deep sense of purpose and belonging um, are also what rise to the top in terms rise up within people and within communities in times of crisis. Um, and these go to these very deep narratives, like are we inherently competitive or cooperative. Um, yeah, Patrick. Well, and just to say this, again, to sharpen our practice around seeing and naming narrative power, when you describe those stories around human nature and cooperation, that what I always, what it brings to mind for me is terms and ideologies like social Darwinism. You know, and that word gets thrown around, but when you unpack it a little bit, it gets thrown around to mean that, oh, society is inherently Com competitive and that's the way it is, that's how humans are. When you unpack that term, it's a great lesson in how narratives get created. You know, that's an example of 19th century aristocrats looking for a way to justify a totally ruthless inequities in wealth and opportunity in society. I say and it's natural. Yeah, by saying it's natural and leaning into science as a legitimizer for that and, and elevating Darwin and the theory of evolution as a way to say, this is the way things really are. This is the status quo. And of course, Darwin certainly highlighted the aspects of competition in, human, in, in evolution, the evolution of life, but he also equally emphasized cooperation. 
But that gets left out of the definition of what social Darwinism is, because that's the story that served the interests of the people who created the story. And I think that's an important question when we're thinking about apocalyptic narratives to always, the narrative power analysis question is, whose apocalypse is it? Whose story is shaping our perception of this? Who is the author of this script that we're being forced to enact? Yeah, absolutely. And related to this, something that I've been um, really feeling into in terms of these questions about what is society? What does it mean to be human? What is our relationships with each other? And how does a virus interact with this, with these relationships, right? Is in this time of physical distancing, looking at all of the social closening that is happening. Right? Like we literally cannot touch each other and yet we're touching each other in so many ways in terms of resource, in terms of support, <laughs> um, right? Like connecting through virtual realms, right? Through screens and right? One response to a pandemic, right? And shelter in place may lift at the end of this month but we may be in an alternating containment situation for the unforeseeable future. Pandemics may also be right our long future is right. There is a lot of policed and in some places in the world militarized containment going on, right? And an alternative to this is care in terms of the ways in a very real lived felt sense. And this is something that I hope that we carry with us. Um, as we start to you know, reintegrate and open up again, et cetera, um, is this felt sense of consideration and solidarity, right? For healthcare workers, they're wearing PPE to protect themselves and others, right? But we understand that when we're walking around in public spaces and we're wearing a mask or some kind of face covering, it's not to protect ourselves, at the, but we're actually protecting other people. And that is an incredible repetitive action and awareness to have throughout all of our mundane everyday activities, right? And at this point, like going on a grocery store run is like a hero's journey <laughs> um, to go and come back. Um, yesterday, I was walking down the street in my neighborhood and I had a scarf to be able to pull over my mouth and nose, but it was down because no one was around. And I was approaching a man standing by a car who had a face mask that was also down. And as we came closer, I pulled up the scarf around my face and he pulled up the mask around his and we made eye contact and waved at each other, right? And that is, I was so touched by that moment um, and how much change has happened within a short amount of time. Um, whereas at first with physical distancing, it felt so incredibly strange to move away from people on the street because that's something that we understand that movement um, conveys you know, hostility or suspicion. And now it means something very different, respect and um, consideration. Well, and just the way it's, it's mainstreamed solidarity as a kind of yeah. collective survival tactic. I mean, solidarity has been the basis and of so much collective action, social movement struggle for since time immemorial. And it's a concept that's sort of been removed from our current consumerist sort of faux democracy that we live in. And for folks to have that revived and understand solidarity, I think is so, so profound. Such an incredible thing, as you say, we're rehearsing. Well, I can't, I can't resist the temptation to ask you to just talk a little bit about um, about plague narratives in this context. I mean, so much of the way and the, the research and the expertise you bring about comes in the COVID, you mentioned a little bit of it there, but just wanted to encourage you to say a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, just to acknowledge briefly, right? That this is a time of plague that people are experiencing, like we're having a massive shared experience and people are experiencing very differently. Um, and there's a lot of ways that we are making meaning of this plague, um, which also brings into focus, right? Some of the pre-existing conditions in terms of different socioeconomic plagues that make a virus like this more deadly. 
And I want to just acknowledge that Right, plagues and pandemics have been a long part of our past in the recent past and the more distant past. And there have been lots of ways that people have struggled with existential crisis and doubt to make meaning um, of a plague that may not be for some higher good. There may not be a silver lining. Um, again, like doubting and feeling some of the ineptitude of different institutions, um, doubting divine powers that this is happening for any good reason, um, different types of uh, institution and infrastructure crumbling. And so one of these refrains throughout history that plague narratives bring up is that no one is con in control any longer right, that the disaster is outpacing different leaders' ability to respond, um, and that it is up to people to create new paths and meanings, which we're seeing right now in so many incredible ways of just this amazing proliferation of mutual aid, um, right? Are, are you trying to say networks. that Donald Trump is not going to save us? I think I did just say yeah. that. <laughs> I did just say that, and in terms of... <laughs> Apocalyptic film, you know, spoiler alert, uh, Matt Damon and Brad Pitt are not also not going to save us. <laughs> right. And one of the narratives that we also see crumble in times of um, disaster um, is of this fetishizing of a superhero charismatic leader or messiah who is going to save us. Right. So in different apocalyptic scenarios and realities, who is the protagonist, right? And is it the community, <laughs> the people um, who are navigating and figuring out different ways to survive and thrive and support each other through this? Um, well, yeah. I have to jump in on that point because that's so provocative. I think just the superhero piece in general, I mean, it's impossible to miss our current cultural obsession, particularly oh, yeah. obsession with superheroes. And I think it just, it shows this example of a certain type of heroic narrative. Whereas I think what we're fighting for, for real change is, is making collective action, the, the hero and shero of the story, um, that there aren't um, saviors and messiahs as you say, but the way people have succeeded in solving their problems is by working together. And particularly in this culture where we've dealt with such a history of horrible injustices from indigenous genocide to the enslavement of, of folks of African descent to the ongoing divisions of equity and dignity, um, you know, to recognize that people have made change by coming together. That's how slavery got ended. That's how the reason we have the eight hour workday. That's the reason that um, more folks can vote than used to be the case. So collective action um, in COVID, I think has been so interesting um, because it's, it's very different you know, in terms of the work that I do as a climate um, organizer and activist was the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. We were hoping as part of the global mobilization, but you know, millions, if not tens of millions of people on the streets and actually taking nonviolent direct action against particularly the fossil fuel industry and against the banks that are funding the fossil fuel industry and unaccountable government officials that are doing the will of corporations and sacrificing our future. Lo and behold, COVID, that just wasn't a possible thing to do, but people are still finding ways to engage in that solidarity and being creative um, in their action. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of um, commentary online, um, in terms of looking, you know, for many people, this time has been unprecedented experience of cooperation on a mass scale. And within a very short amount of time, we are seeing some of the impacts on the extra human or more than human world in terms of reduction of pollution, rewilding, right? Like different wild animals um, coming forth as so much of our polluting industries um, reduce and recede. Um, and, you know, we are joining around this effort to flatten the curve <laughs> um, 
joining around this effort to flatten the curve, um, right, to protect people from infection. And something that we've been wondering is how this time is and this shared experience is preparing us to flatten this much larger curve of climate um, sustainability um, and collapse. Um, and part of that, right, is around our sense of time, which goes very deep. Um, in terms of COVID and flattening this curve, what is compelling us? Who are we doing it for? Th we are, and the people that we know and are close to are the future ones, right? Where we're talking about months. And some of the tragedy of time frames is that when we're talking about the collective action that's needed that we're getting a sense of right now, of our impact um, that's needed uh, to um, make ways towards more sustainable futures, this is for generations in the future, right? That may seem more abstract. Um, Patrick, do you wanna comment about this in terms of climate narratives? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> climate, and I think the climate discourse is just straight up apocalyptic. Um, I don't know how many folks listening to us either on this broadcast or on the future podcast, how closely people follow climate science. But I think most people at this point that are paying attention recognize how serious um, the science is and how truly apocalyptic it is. I'd call it uh, in, in the context that we've been talking about here, it's a slow motion apocalypse. It's kind of rolling out over time. It's punctuated by extreme um, events that suddenly you know, a community is hit by uh, a hurricane or a drought, or remember those Australian wildfires that were <laughs> scaring the willies out of everybody and then suddenly COVID came along and kind of left the discourse. So it is, um, climate is very apocalyptic and um, really understand that we're already living through climate breakdown, the destabilization of the life support systems of our planet. And I think in terms of narrative, what we're talking about here, what you were saying about time um, is are really, resonates with one of the, the challenges in the climate discourse where people kind of know that um, it's this huge threat and it's looming and it's a little beyond the horizon. And I think until quite recently, there was sort of an assumption that it was a future problem and people maybe felt bad that they were screwing over their grandkids. And I think now people are realizing how, how present it is right now. We're living through climate mm -hmm. destabilization and how urgent it is. And this question of hope um, versus fear, um, is central to the climate discourse. I mean, I think we currently have, it's worth remembering, um, a president and a Republican party in this country that are official climate deniers that claim that this is not actually happening. Honestly, that's a cynical ploy. That's just an effort to prevent change. So it's less a strategy about persuasion to challenge that narrative and just a strategy of directly getting these people out of power. But in some ways, a, a more terrifying form of climate denial is what we can call climate delay. It's more represented by folks that think, oh, well, we'll commit to something by 2050 or we'll increase our renewables. Um, you know, this is the sort of Joe Bidens of the world in the mainstream, the Democratic Party, that think that there is a future in this current system rather than understanding what the science is telling us is that we need a rapid, rapid transition away from fossil fuels and to renewable energy. Within the next decade, we need to reduce emissions and dramatically transform um, our global energy system. Um, so that's, that's, that's a pretty high um, leap, it's important. And particularly if the real danger becomes in a third climate narrative, I think, of climate fatalism, is people look at how entrenched the powers that be are, how serious the problem is, how far down the path of ecological collapse we already are. And they think, all right, there's no, it's not gonna change. We can't, it's not possible. And that's why it's so important that we find collective agency within this. It's so important that we be putting out visions of transformation that match the scale of the crisis. Otherwise we play into the sort of um, this kind of climate fatalism. And underneath that, underneath that narrative is a lot of terrifying control mythologies that can come rushing into the political vacuum that's opening up. You know, this is the world of, uh, of scarcity. 
of fear of competition. This is this is Mad Max, you know, um, and particularly knowing that you know we should understand that white nationalists, Nazis, fascists. It's not a coincidence that the Nazi slogan was blood and soil. You know, a lot of these ecological, um, this ecological situation can be a real opening for eco-fascists. And particularly as we look at the kind of xenophobia, racism and militarization we already have in this country, um, it becomes very, um, very apocalyptic. And if we're not operating at that level, just to be a little more specific, you know, the um, already climate refugees and displacement is happening, but we know that over the next, um, the next couple decades, hundreds of millions of people are going to be displaced by climate disasters, portions of our planet are on path to become uninhabitable. The people that are living in those areas, primarily in the tropics, are primarily low income communities, people of color, um, and their future homes and their future support is gonna to need to be here in the global north. And it's gonna to need to be us extending our solidarity and extending our responsibility um, to incorporate that and to connect the dots and make sure that we're telling stories about the climate crisis and about the ecological crisis that are have a place for collective action where hope can become real and hope can be stronger than despair. And if we can't win that framing battle and if we can't make movements that rise to that challenge, then I think we really are looking at a very apocalyptic future. Um, and I wanna add uh, to what you said, right? That these narratives, um, as we said before, are very much bound up with our time perception. And so that's also a question that we can carry with us in terms of engaging with different narratives um, that make meaning of reality or of different apocalyptic fiction is do they inspire urgency and at what cost? Um, and do they inspire slowness and open up space to engage in critical thinking, in feeling um, our hearts, grieving, mourning, being able to come from a more compassionate place, right? And part of what is driving um, right, capitalist um, apocalyptic realities is this time frame, this short-sighted time frame that is focused on maximizing profits um, for the bottom line, right? For this quarter's profits. Um, and that is very different than a perspective of, right, of seven generations and how that that should inform our decision-making right now. And that that is part of the work that we need to do is to be continually time traveling and stretching our imaginations and our time perspectives to travel to the future, to feel those futures um, so that we can inhabit and engage with the present in a different way. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the reality that transition is, is inevitable. There literally is no future in our current system. Um, and the question is collapse or transition? And then the question becomes what type of transition are we talking about? Mm -hmm. And who's going to be shaping that transition and who's gonna be there on the other side? I mean, that's the opportunity, what we're rehearsing with COVID in some ways that's so relevant to the climate crisis is how to extend our sense of solidarity and self-interest and keep extending it further and further. Um, hopefully beyond the kind of historic divisions of race and class and country um, and starting to think about it globally and then extending it beyond overcoming one of the core control mythologies that's been so destructive, this idea that humans are somehow separate from nature and are starting to really, um, in the spirit of so much of pan indigenous wisdom, to think about all our relations, to think about how we're part of the web of life, to have a biosphere consciousness that recognizes we all share an atmospheric system. We're all impacted by the climate crisis. Again, we're not all impacted equally. We don't all live next to a fossil fuel um, refinery and are not being contaminated by it. We don't all live on the coastline in Bangladesh, but we are all working together to shape um, a common future. And that shows some of the real liberatory potential um, if we can intervene in the kind of status quo climate fatalism apocalyptic narrative. Mm. On that note, something that has really struck me um, over and over 
in terms of looking at different apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic film, television, reading literature, is that in all kinds of different iterations, what we're experiencing um, as audience, as reader, as dreamer, um, is certain destruction, right? Like that we know, <laughs> destruction of the old world. Um, but then it is interesting to look at what is the note that it ends on that then lingers as we leave the movie theater or turn off Netflix or put down the book, right? And that note is often of uncertain hope, right? Destruction is certain, but the future is uncertain. It is like a small sprout that we need to tend to, um, which is inviting our, um, our uh, attention um, to be like, right, this is not, um, right, dystopian fiction, which is such a defining genre of our times, is often not cathartic where things are resolved at the end, right? At the end, it is deeply jarring and unsettling of like, okay, how are, what are we now stitching together from what has been unraveled, right? And how are we doing that? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll come out and say it. I'm pro-apocalypse, bring it on. Uh, I mean, what other choice do we really have? I shouldn't say that I'm really pro-apocalypse in terms of I'm pro-apocalypses, plural, um, a people's apocalypse, if you will, um, that yeah. this kind of dramatic and radical transformation um, needs, to be, um, needs to be central to how we're thinking about our lives, regardless of whether you're someone that thinks of yourself as an activist or an organizer, um, just as a member of the communities that you are, that are a member as, a, as an earthling, um, if you will, that unless we can shake this sort of doomsday trajectory that corporate capitalism's got us on, um, then we know where we're going. That's why it's a doomsday trajectory. And that's what apocalypses do. Um, and what our stories about the apocalypse do, I think that, connection as we're kind of wrapping up here, you know, thinking about some of the ground that we've covered, that, that connection between how a narrative works and how it, whether it enables you, whether it empowers you, or whether it disempowers you. There's a, a key component of collective action um, that is really operating in terms of narrative. If you think about our social movements, really what a social movement is, is really a shared story. Um, people coming together to have a common understanding of the problem they're facing, and perhaps most importantly, uh, uh, creating a shared story of the alternative, of what could be different. And then folks move forward, unleashing their collective creativity um, to make that story come true. And I think that's, that's really a, a, a sort of template for social change. And here in these apocalyptic times we live in, um, it's getting ramped up. It is getting ramped, ramped up and we can imagine, right, that everything we're talking about will be for the rest of our lives, right? And this is so much of the work that we cut, have cut out for us of to dream these alternatives and to fight for them and to make them real, um, right? Which can often begin in this place of, um, of imagination. Um, I want to uh, lift up just some of the strategies that bring together imagination and action. Um, Patrick has talked about a number of them, um, but this importance of stretching ourselves, our hearts and minds and doing this time travel between near and distant future and so we can come back to the present in the new way um, is present for example in different um, rituals and exercises such as Joanna Macy's um, Ancestors of the Future, um, where it creates this timeless encounter between us as ancestors of the future, which we literally are, with beings 200 years from now, right? And it's tapping in um, to a sense of hope, sense of despair, grief, longing, yearning to be like, what might that conversation be? to have these future beings asking us about what it was like in our time, what fortified our courage, um, what were people doing that brought about, that made possible this livable, habitable future on planet earth? Um, you know, what were some of the headlines and milestones right now, some, right, 
these days we're seeing headlines that feel like they're headlines from a sci-fi future, like the UN Secretary General say, asking for a global ceasefire so that we can all fight this virus. Um, if there was a museum of the future, what would be relics from the past, from our fossil fuel era that we've outgrown, right? Um, and so doing that kind of time travel um, can help us come back and be like, well, then how do we actually get there, um, right? And to feel that firing up of our full humanity. Um, and, you know, when we've been talking about control mythologies in the veil of part of this work is us all acting together um, as microorganisms, as earthworms um, to decompose these mythologies that uphold, um, that uphold injustice and that uphold, um, uh, that are driving us on these uh, apocalyptic trajectories for so long. Um, I wanna close uh, with a quote um, from Dr. Ruha Benjamin, who is evoking a famous quote by James Baldwin. And she says, remember to, dis remember to imagine and craft the worlds you cannot live without, just as you dismantle the ones you cannot live within. Thank you everyone uh, for your time and attention. Uh, and we want to invite Jason back. Well, I think we actually have some questions to um, answer first. Um, if you, on our little thing of seeing all of these questions and we have some fantastic ones, thank you. <laughs> so many of these things that are, um, that were being asked here. Um, picking one of these questions, um, it, uh, here's a, a question. Um, Since all empires rise and fall, how can the dominant paradigm of mass misogyny be unveiled revealed in this apocalypse so that the multi-millennial empire mm. of patriarchy fall? Here's a question. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the big questions, right? Um, you know, and, and I, um, Zara may have a magic answer to that. I don't, um, but the, I think part of the, the secret of how any story changes, um, the first step is understanding that it's a story. That's why narrative power analysis is so that it's not reality, that, you know, instead of, Tina and that control mythology that we can show the alternatives. One of the great contrasts um, to Tina is taboo. There are billions of, of alternatives, of billions of other options. Um, and so I think um, one of the ways that the connection between narrative and organizing, I believe very deeply that organizing also it changes the world. People coming together to take collective action. And I think particularly, um, women and um, non-binary folks, the incredible leadership that we're seeing in so many movements around the world are, are on a constant effort of undermining um, the sort of, as you say, the empire of, of patriarchy and misogyny. And um, I think that's, I think it's well underway. The project continues. It's not one of those things that you flip a switch and the empire falls, but I think we keep, we keep struggling away at the work. Yeah, I just wanna say, uh, I love this question. I wanna, <laughs> put it up on my wall. <laughs> um, it is not possible to do full justice to it. Um, I feel like this is a question that needs to remain continually open for us to keep truly living into. Um, and I think it's really vital when we're talking about patriarchy, right? And cis heteropatriarchy, which is such an old and deeply entrenched system in terms of an intersectional analysis that we see these deeply intertwined tap roots with patriarchy, with white supremacy, with the ways that capitalism is on this ecocidal collision course with the life support systems of the planet to see how these different uprooting efforts support each other, right? Because each of them help the other gain greater traction. So what is that continual uprooting work? Right? Because when we're talking about like a crisis or a disaster, this is like an acute condition. Um, and what you're raising is a deeply sedimented chronic condition that needs chronic care. And so the more of the ways that we can see like, well, how has patriarchy and all the devaluation of 
lives and ways of being um, in how it operates, how does that connect with this human nature binary, right? In terms of othering, in terms of marginalization, in terms of exploitation, how does it intersect with the ideologies of superiority and inferiority of white supremacy, right? And other isms um, so that there's this continual intersectional uprooting um, as we're planting different liberatory visions. I'm gonna lump together two of these questions that seem kind of related. One question here is, what do we do about the conspiracy theory narratives around both COVID and climate change? And what do you think are some of the best ways to amplify news stories when the dominant culture, and especially Fox News, has so much grab? I think these two are very related. Um, speaking from a purely kind of uh, social change and political perspective here, it's, I think, essential for us to understand the United States that there has been a right wing takeover over the last 40 years of most institutions in our culture. Um, and particularly when we where we find ourselves now with something like Fox News, which is uh, literally political propaganda for the for the ruling party right now. Um, and so. You know, conspiracy theories, people, again, when we go back to how narrative power operates, um, we see how, you know, helping people ask the questions about a narrative, that any narrative, I mean, I think the, the short answer to this question is that we need to develop critical literacy among a mass um, component of the population so that any story, any information that they're receiving, we're sort of all trained to ask, Who's telling me this information? What is their agenda? What is not being told to me? You know, in a narrative power analysis, when we're doing it with a campaign group or doing it in the context of a specific thing, a lot of what we focus on is understanding the underlying assumptions of a narrative. And the reason I mention that now is because the assumptions are critical. They're often where the power lives in a story and they're sometimes not included. And the assumptions are what you have to believe to believe that the story is true. So we're, we're dealing with a very toxic dominant culture in this country, which we, you know, based on the history um, of what's grown up and the way the violence and the ongoing structural injustice that keeps this country around. And so that means that in our organizing, we have to amplify different stories. And we have to be consciously aware of which worldviews are we hearkening to. When we're out there um, taking our actions, how are we reinforcing the worldview of cooperation and human dignity? And how are we challenging um, the worldview? Um, but one of the most effective tools is I think to expose that the story is just a story and to expose who's telling the story. It's kind of, if you think of a, let me see if I can get my Wizard of Oz metaphor here. I might be muddling the movie, um, but like you rip away the curtain and you see there isn't a wizard there's just this little person behind the curtain that act which takes all sorts of different ways in political action is one of the most powerful ways that people can help click out of a story and click into their own story let me yeah, hand it over to zara absolutely. to take take another question yeah well just to also add to that 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 right pulling aside the curtain part of that curtain that's getting pulled aside is that the status quo um Right, and dominant powers maintain themselves by being shrouded in this aura of inevitability, right? And that they're somehow eternal, right? And so to actually have this decolonizing process saying like, who's sending this message, right? That's not just the way these things are. This is not just a force of nature. It's been actually constructed by people with a certain agenda um, for certain purposes um, is incredibly helpful. On the note of, it's not a conspiracy theory, <laughs> exactly. Um, but one thing that I wanna bring up is that something that has made me feel very tense on nearly a daily basis during this pandemic has been hearing um, from progressive people, a narrative um, that is saying, like an eco-spiritual narrative saying that this virus is a gift from the earth to wake us up and to make us change our ways. And yes, viruses do come from the earth. It's where all viruses come from. Yes, we are forced to confront our human and extra human relations. Yes, we are waking up in different ways, but to ascribe a divine um, agenda to this virus as a meaning-making or coping strategy 
because it can be so intolerable to feel that all this suffering um, is not happening for some higher good is incredibly dangerous um, in terms of the bypassing and dismissing of human and distancing around human suffering. And so that's been a question for me of like, what are narratives that are helping us make meaning of this time where we are staying close to human suffering and where we are staying close to the realities of ecological impacts. Um, another another yeah. question for us here. Um, what are some of the resistances and openings you see to re-narrativizing, love that word, thank you for throwing that word out there, openings you see to re-narrativizing and how can we encourage the seeing and naming of dominant narrative, crafting new narratives? Um, <laughs> I definitely want to put a plug for Patrick's book there. Yeah. <laughs> Reimagining yeah. change because it goes into such depth with also historic and contemporary case studies. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for the purpose of this conversation, um, within the work that I've done on narrative and, and particularly the organization that I um, founded, the Center for Story-Based Strategy does a lot of this work with grassroots movements and, and um, frontline groups around the country. Intervention, how do you intervene in a narrative? That's what's so essential. We don't all own a Fox News or, or a Washington Post. Um, so we have to actually use our bodies and use our actions to hijack the spectacle, to reclaim it, um, and to move um, other stories that are out there. And I just want to say this is, if folks aren't plugged into it, this is an incredible time of organizing and resistance. This is a, a, a renaissance of wildcat strikes out there of, you know, from the Amazon workers um, in the warehouses who've been taking action, not only to protect themselves, but Amazon workers have been organizing um, to challenge um, the company's um, carbon footprint and to connect the dots um, between climate and workers' rights. Um, there's wildcat strikes happening all over the place, fast food workers that are striking. Um, if you're looking for ways to plug in, check out your central um, labor council. Um, in your community, in your county, wherever you live, and you can find a pathway probably to some of the active strikes that are happening. Um, and there's incredible opportunity. And really, when you think of some of the big narratives that are at play right now, like a Green New Deal, and the whole platform that's been put out there about how as we're making this transition off of fossil fuels, we have an opportunity to restructure our entire economy, to make sure we have a just transition, not only for the workers who are currently in fossil fuel industry, but also for the communities who have been impacted by 100 years of fossil fuel extraction, contamination, and pollution. And right now, I think one of the ways to think about the wave of strikes that's happening is this is really an emergency Green New Deal is what people are fighting for. We need rent strikes right now. We need a massive influx of um, unemployment um, funds and guarantees for folks. We need universal health care. We need it right now. And folks are fighting for that. And there's an incredible opportunity that's happening because of the apocalyptic moment we're in. And by that, we mean ripping off the veil and the transition that's going on. So great time um, to plug into all of those things, as I'm sure many people listening to this are already doing that work in their own community. Yeah, I want to um, add to this, that um, in terms of this uh, resistances and openings that in times of crisis, different regressive forces can hold on a lot more tightly, right? And there can be a deepening entrenchment of racism, of misogyny, of militarization um, and something that can help to create these openings is that in times of crisis and shock, and Naomi Klein has written about this in her book, The Shock Doctrine, we can experience a lot of disorientation, um, right? And destabilization during which time, um, uh, you know, repressive forces um, and privatizing neoliberal forces really take advantage of and are on the move. And one antidote to that is having a historical perspective, right? Of to see like, how is the moment that we're in now? Like what has been replayed before? How have these moments of shock been exploited by different powers in the past? Um, so that we can predict and know that that is happening and is going to happen, um, which can boost our it can help orient us 
um, to hold that ground to say that there are other ways and to point out who and we're not hearing from and what we're not seeing and to really work to amplify that. We should have maybe just one more question. Excellent. Um, so I see a question uh, here that says, um, who do you see that is out there leading the way for us to learn about, I am missing leaders right now and community that has a purpose. And um, I, I hear that, I hear how the isolation of this times can make things um, challenging. But I wanna turn that question around. Um, I think we're, uh, successful movements are leaderful. Um, there's all sorts of collective action that's happening and for ways to find their own, for all of us to find our connection to that. So just throwing out a couple examples, um, people may be familiar with the Poor People's Campaign, an incredible um, cross-sector mobilization following in the tradition of uh, Martin Luther King's Poor People's Campaign that's been going on for a few years. Um, great way to plug into doing system change work. Um, the organization that I work with, my own organization, 350.org, is a global um, climate organization working to mobilize around people power. Specifically, uh, something that I encourage folks to be paying attention to right now, um, you can go to a website called The Promise to Protect, um, which is a, a frontline coalition of indigenous um, communities in the the Dakotas and the center of the country where the Keystone XL pipeline is being um, built. And right now, back to our conversations about who's an essential worker and what is essential, um, we have a shocking situation going on where the Trump administration is pushing through ongoing fossil fuel expansion and production and claiming that's essential. Um, and the Keystone um, pipeline, which has been defeated by our movements a number of times. It's a zombie fossil fuel project. We keep killing it, but it keeps coming back um, in the spirit of, of Standing Rock and the frontline indigenous resistance that's happened to so many of the fossil fuel projects that have been stopped. Um, the Keystone right now um, is underway and literally they're pushing through the Keystone production, uh, the Keystone construction, because almost 50,000 people have signed up on the Promise to Protect website to, to, if the indigenous leadership on the ground puts out the call, that folks will come there and support them in their resistance to prevent um, this climate destroying, water destroying, rights destroying, um, horrific project from happening. So that's just one example. Um, but I think there's there's lots of stuff out there that's going on and lots of ways that folks can plug in. Um, there's a question on recommendations for reading, watching, listening, uh, so many. <laughs> um, we could perhaps make a compilation after this. <laughs> that gets shared, I'm not sure, um, since it's hard to narrow down in our remaining minute. Um, currently, I'm reading the Broken Earth Trilogy by N.K. Jemison, which I highly recommend. Um, certainly the work of Octavia Butler, also tuning into Octavia's Brood. Again, the work of Adrian Marie Brown and Wally Dot Marisha, working with um, social justice organizers to create um, science fiction. Um, looking into, you know, and there's compilations out there online in terms of indigenous futurist writers. For example, um, the book, The Marrow Thieves by Sherry Dimaline, which is bringing together these pasts and futures, um, right? And so it's really interesting to look at what dots are being connected and this um, connection between very deep memory resistance and uncertain futures. Um, you just read the newspaper these days. It's pretty darn popular. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, right, we're at this time where, and again, with like the question about conspiracy theories where a lot of really out there conspiracy theories actually pale in comparison to daily unfolding reality. Right, and we live in very sci-fi times and there's so many ways that um, science fiction over the decades, um, you know, we've, we've outpaced some of those or we've, you know, gone beyond some of those really out there imaginings. Um, and, just, and just echoing that theme of the importance of speculative fiction as a way to really um, hone our imagination 
um, that imagination is probably the greatest social change tool that we have in this era. And I think I'm, I don't know if I'm quoting, I'm probably um, muddling the quote a little bit, but I think it's the uh, great science fiction writer, Kim Stanley Robinson, who says, science fiction is the nonfiction of our times. The <laughs> realism of, of our times. The, the realism of yeah. our times. Um, uh, so let's end there. And thank say, you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Zara. Thank you, thank you Patrick. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Good night, thank Moon. You. Good night, <laughs> Zoom. Good night, Sense of Impending Doom. And hi, Jason. Yeah, thanks so much. That was wonderful. And we definitely can compile all those books and resources to send out to people who watch tonight. Fantastic. Yeah, and we'd love to we do can that. Do, we can do that through our ticketing system. So that sounds like a great idea, and I'm into it too. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us tonight. That was wonderful. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much to CIS for hosting this conversation and so many of the other important conversations you host. All right. Well, have a great night. You too. Good night. And thank all of you so much for attending tonight. We hope that you will join us for more of our upcoming events. We are announcing new ones every day and our next event will be Exploring Rumi to Make Sense of Ourselves, an online conversation with Melody Mowesi and Shoshana Simons next Wednesday, May 20th. We have posted the link in the chat if you want to learn more. This conversation was recorded tonight. So if you'd like to watch it again or share it with your community, it can be found at this same link on YouTube or on our Facebook page. We will also feature this talk on our podcast, which you can find at www.ciispod.com or by searching CIIS Public Programs on your favorite podcast app. Thanks again for joining us and good night.